Today I kind of wanted to piggyback just off of the whole service today. It's been pretty awesome. Who loved worship? Woo! I love Broken Vessels, so Alexis, amazing job. I know I taught you everything you know when it comes to singing. Uh, yeah, just we'll work on some things after service. We'll talk about it. <laughs> no, but I just love just how amazing the love of Jesus is for our lives. I think that's the new process that I'm in right now, just realizing how great and how deep his love is for us. Can we put up my first scripture, please? It says in Romans 8, 37 through 39, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and I, I love that scripture so much uh, because it, it's really helped me in the season of saying like, wow, I, I'm actually loved by God. Isn't that crazy? If you think about it, like take a step back from it, it's pretty deep that there's a God above where there's millions of people, but he says nothing could separate you and I from the love of God. And this is coming from Paul. Okay, Paul was hunted down. Uh, he's been in shipwrecks. He's been bitten by snakes. And he's talking about none of that could separate him from the love of God. But isn't it funny, though, that in life, a lot of us, we, we tend to question the love of God when those things come. We, we tend to question if, if the love is still even there. But even Paul, a brother who was shipwrecked and then got the people who he shipwrecked with saved, was like, hey, man, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And they made it all out alive. And I bet actually in great shape. They came out feeling more confident and with hope with Paul there. You know, and I, it's, it's just crazy to believe how, what faith can do to a person. Of how, how crazy faith and, and this belief of how much God loves you and I can take you. And I, and I find it, you know, uh, a cycle in humanity that when life hits, we, we, we begin to question his love for us. You see, it says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even angels, nor demons, nor life, but I can tell you the one thing that can get away of the love of God is you and me. We're the ones who stop the connection. See, nothing else can. The devil can't. Okay, life can't. But me and you, we, since we've been given this power in our tongue, we've been given this power by Jesus, we're the ones who can cause the disconnection. And I've realized that, that a lot of us can, can live through life and we can play church and we can go in a service. We, we can say, yes, yes, pastor, that was an amazing job you did going up there uh, during worship. That was great, but you don't even believe a thing. You, you still walk in here with shackles of how you feel, of, of what you think about yourself. See, that's not freedom. That's, that's not seeing the love of God or the depth of it. That's you being in bondage to, to the past to the shame, to the guilt. And, and, I, and I've just been just in going in this process of learning like this scripture of what, what love really means. And you know what love means? It, mean, it means being free. Yeah. It means being okay with where you're at. It means accepting where you are. You know, and here's a funny story. Who, who here likes driving, right? Going far, like you're the person who doesn't like to be driven. Who's that here? okay. And then when you go far, you put on, you know, MapQuest, right? Or, or that's kind of old. Uh, <laughs> ways, ways. I, because no one does that anymore. They're like, no, actually, I only use the iPhone one. Like, I'm like, dang, okay, sorry, that ways gives you ten better ways, ways. Um, I'll send the link to my bank account, ways, if you want to just, you know, plug me in. No, but when we drive, we we follow directions, right? But how many of you have been driving, right? And you're, and you're driving, and you can't tell sometimes of where it wants you to go right or left on the freeway exit. And then you're like, I think I know where it's going. And you go right. And then it says, uh, rerouting, right? <laughs> and then you're like, but then you got that split second where you got people in the car, and you can blame it on the GPS. Like, man, this thing told me go right, and it, like, didn't even work. Man, I knew. I knew it. I knew I should have just trusted my feelings. And you're just trying to cover for yourself. That happened to me the other day when I went with Dario. We were driving on the freeway. Remember, Dario, we were driving. He's like, hey, you're going to take this exit. And I thought I knew the better exit. I thought I knew the better exit. So I took the better one. 
right? And then he's like, hey, you went the wrong way. And I was like, oh, I'm... And I couldn't blame it on, on the GPS because he was holding it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm all thinking split second here. <laughs> what can I blame it on? And this is like, I'm going. Like you ever seen a, the movie, I forgot what, who was it, Denzel Washington. And he sees like all these different scenarios. Yes, the equalizer. That's what I was trying to do. What can I make the scapegoat? And then I just was like, no, I guess I'm just going to have to take this one. I was like, hey, Dario, sorry, man. Uh, I didn't see it. It was on your lap. You know, like when you kind of give like <laughs> that, like, <laughs> hey, man, I didn't see it. It was on your lap. <laughs> you know, I tried to cover for myself. And, of course, Dario, he's like the nicest guy. He's like, hey, no problem. All right, I'll just sh- take you to the next one. I was like, woo, in the inside. He, he took it. He took the bait. <laughs> but how many of us realize that that's kind of like our walk with God, Right? Jesus is our GPS, and then he tells us to go right, but then we like to go left, right? And then we, we blame it back on him. Hey, I don't feel God's love anymore for me. I, I, I don't see his relevance in my life, pastor. I, you, you always talk about miracles. How come I don't see him? How come I don't get this? How come I don't get that, that, that? And in reality, we have to take responsibility for the mistakes that we've made along the journey. Because a lot of us, we like to drive, right? We, we always say, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. No, most of the time it's you taking the wheel. Okay? And there's dents and there's scratches on that car. But, but even then, we still don't take the responsibility for that. When it's visible that, that we're not following God, but we still try to find someone else to blame it on. Yeah. We do that. I've done that. I'm like, oh no, sometimes, I mean, I'm not the super loving type. I'm growing there. I'm more like straight forward. I get, I get that part from my dad, but my dad's been learning over the years like how to love, so he knows how to cover it. I don't, I haven't developed that. You, I get the strong part, you know how to love. I don't know how to love yet, I'm learning there. Because I just like, my dad's always like, Isaac, you gotta you know, say it a little bit more with love. And I'm like, uh. What's that have to do with this? <laughs> this is where it goes. So I'm struggling there. And I, and I always like to just blame it on the other person because they're making me frustrated. I'm like, no, they're doing this. They're doing that. They're doing this. And then my dad's like, hey, what are you not doing? Okay? Wow. If you want to lead people and if you want to be Jesus and you're like, God, make me the hands and feet. <laughs> yes, God. Amazing grace. Like, that means grace other people, not just yourself. But also mean, that means that you have to take the grace for yourself and take responsibility for the mistakes that you've made. Can we put up the next scripture? John 8, 3, 6. But Jesus said, so if the son sets you free from sin, then become a true son and be unquestionably free. I love it. It says unquestionably free. There's no doubt. You know how you get no doubt in your freedom? When number one, you admit to where you failed, to where you've fallen off. Can we put up my points, please? It's taking responsibility for our actions. Admit the need for Jesus' help and live free by remembering what Jesus did. Okay, but take into account the people who have encountered God. Who's encountered God here? Who's had a God encounter? Whether it be in a message, prayer, worship. Do you remember in that moment when you met, when you met Jesus? Do you, do you remember what got you there? Usually, for me, It's been of a place of humility, realizing I'm telling God everything that I feel like I am, and I'm saying, God, do something with it. Please, Jesus. I feel unworthy. I feel shameful. I feel guilt. I feel like I'm not good enough. I keep I keep sinning in those areas. I I need your help. You know, and we have that God encounter right there, and then God touches us, and we feel this love and we feel worthy. You know, but then life goes on. And then we forget how we had that encounter. Just because we gave God those things once doesn't mean that it just doesn't happen again and God's just some automatic dispensary of his love. It's a give and you get back type thing. God always is available to love you. But you need to give him those things in those areas again. It's a constant surrender with Jesus. That's how you have to live your life. That's what I'm realizing for me right now. I realize that I haven't given God some things. That I haven't been... I've been asking God, God, I need your encounter. I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that. But I'm not willing to take responsibility for the actions that I've made that have gotten me here. 
That's the beautiful thing about Jesus, that he's a man who loves to not just love you, but he likes to show you and grow you. And that means a constant responsibility with your life. That means saying, you know what? I, I want a God encounter again. I, I, I want God to be able to lead me further. I want people to look at me and say, wow, that, that's someone who's in constant surrender, and I need to follow God as he follows God or her. But, but that means getting real. That means really just, just diving in and realizing that, that what Jesus did for you on the cross. And a lot of us, we, we say we're free. We, we believe it. We say, you know, Jesus, he set me free. But then we go back on Monday and then we feel enslaved again. Then we go on Tuesday and we feel a little bit better. Then Wednesday comes the midweek service. Dang, Pastor Virginia blew it up. I feel good. Yeah. <laughs> Then you walk out, and then you feel back to the slump again. How, who wants to break the cycle here and just live in constant freedom? Right? I'm with that, too. I'm clapping because I'm preaching to myself. And I think when you, when you start to realize your cycle and you start to realize where you're at, and you start taking accountability, then you get to realize your pattern. For me, here's my pattern. I, I forgive myself, right? And that takes forever. Who, who, who's here is hard on themselves? Amen. <laughs> takes me like a 30-step process. <laughs> but I, I learned to forgive myself. Then I'm like, okay, here's where I can get better at. Um, and then I totally forget what I can get better at, and then I just repeat the cycle all over again. There's never an action plan. There's I remember what I did, but I'm not going to change anything that I did. It's like, you know, skip, skip what passed. Like, I don't know, when you go to church and you feel like, oh, I went on a Sunday, I'm good. You're not. Even, with, even when my parents being pastors, you know, they always told me, Isaac, you, you don't live your relationship uh, with Jesus through us. And I was like, duh hearing that, and then I realized that I fall short of that. For a while, I got comfortable. I was like, you know what? I, I work at the church. I'm good. <laughs> I am good. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. There's no pass. I have to realize that, yeah, even though I work for God, I get to say, and my dad. <laughs> He's awesome. But that doesn't, that doesn't give me a pass to end the cycles just because you work for God, just because you serve. That doesn't mean anything. That, that's an added on blessing. That you get the honor and the privilege to serve. That you get the honor and privilege to be a frontline person and be like, you know, I'm going to win souls for Jesus. But what really says that you're unquestionably free is you ending that cycle. You know what? And like I said, when, when we drive and we take the wrong routes, you realize that you waste more gas going your way than, than just following the one that was intended, intended for you? Right? And then we start blaming God. God, I'm burnt out. Who's the one who went left? Who's the one who went left? God, why do you always leave me on empty? And I, go, I, I went to the family conference. It was good. Everyone was getting, f like, fueled. But, man, the pump was, there was a long line, and I didn't even get anything. But, like my dad said during worship, let's not just, just, just yeah, let's get it. No, let's give in. Let's fully invest in. Take responsibility. Also, even if you're, I'm, I'm not a parent. Shoot, it better not be. You're killing me. <laughs> Heck No. <laughs> Heck no, God's going to have to work on that. I don't know if I want to be a parent. Uh, whew. But I'm investing in it. I'm like, I'm not there yet, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I take some notes. And I, I was talking to Jen in the back that day, and I was like, dang, I think I'm going to be like an authoritarian parent. <laughs> like a dictatorship in my household. <laughs> but I'm writing notes so I can get better. But you know what? My, it's funny, Dad. As I've gotten older, I, don't, I haven't realized how much I've become like you. In a good way. No, I, guys, this isn't a laugh. Dang! Anytime I bring up my dad, it's like laugh at him. Wow, I can't even. This is a heartfelt moment. But I, I have. Then I want you to cry. I haven't realized. 
I haven't realized how much I've become like you in a good way. You've all, I've, you know, being a son and then hearing it, you're like, yeah, dad. But when he's always like, take notes, it's not, it's not real if it's not on paper. Yeah. I never realized how much truth comes to that. Uh, how much when you write something down, it shows that you're listening to the conversation. It shows that you're invested into the conversation. What does that have to do with this? Take notes here. Take notes in the family conference. Take, really invest in yourself in this relationship with Jesus. Like when, when you become friends with somebody, you, you want to make sure that you get to know everything about them, right? You want to make sure. You, you just like, hey, what's your birthday? Hey, what's this? And if they mean something really to you, you're going to put you know, their birthday in your phone, right? The real ones, you put the birthday in your phone. <laughs> if you're not on the phone. <laughs> but I write it down because I care, and I don't want to miss it, right? But with us, we just expect for us to grow with God without any sense of ownership in the relationship as well. Because if you want to grow with God and get this unquestionable freedom within, that means you've got to invest in it as well. Not just invest in the accountability of your mistakes, but you need to be accountable for your progress and your process with God. Because a lot of us get caught up in the process of our own hurt. Oh, I'm in my process, brother. I don't know if I'm going to be there at the 10. I'll see you at the 12. But you just slept in. And then you're like, oh, I'm going through my process. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to go and, and hand out... Um, invite cards at the door. We, we, make, we come up with excuses for our process, but we never, we're never the ones who are like, here's my process for how I'm going to get better. We always go through the process of how I'm going to stay here. Wow. Yeah. Go through your process by all means. I'm not attacking that. But have an have a action plan. Amen. Jesus was a man of an action plan. Yeah. You know, even when Peter sliced off the dude's ear, Jesus wasn't just like, oh, I'm the Messiah. I'm just going to let that happen. No, he's like, he grabbed it, boom, process. Guy, I bet, was like, oh, my God, this guy's real. Process right there. In pain, the ear's off. I bet he's screaming. Then Jesus comes. All right, cool. I love you, man. You're free. In the midst of, of, of the pain. You know what? And I, and, I, and I love what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, but I, I don't think a lot of us pay attention to what Jesus did in Gethsemane. What he did in, in the in that garden, when he's legit laying down, begging God, you know, and he says, the scripture, can we put up the one about the cup? I don't want to butcher it. Luke twenty two, forty two. Father, if you are willing, take this cup of agony away from me, but no matter what, your will must be mine. Look at that selfless prayer. Imagine if we prayed that same prayer. Imagine what progress we would have in our own personal lives if we said, your will must be mine. Must be mine. You know, and some, sometimes I, I grew up thinking that was just a cute prayer. Oh, wow, look at him. He's selfless. He's just giving it all back to God. You know what the crazy thing is? Is, you know, Jesus, it says he brought his three closest disciples with him. And you know what they were doing while, they, while he was praying this prayer? Sleeping. The same, that man... Jesus is praying to get the strength for what he's about to face for the people who he's sleeping. How many of you and I are asleep? Really? How many of us are asleep on Jesus, but we're begging for a miracle? How many of us are, are sleeping on Jesus when we're like, God, I want a revival in my life, but God forbid I pray for more than three minutes. <laughs> Laugh at it, but it's true. Yeah. Laugh at it. Most of us can't even stay focused during a prayer more than five. Because then we think, oh, what's on my schedule today? What am I going to eat? No. Jesus is in agony. It says he was bleeding. He was sweating blood. He knew what that cup meant. You know what that cup is? It's not just the lashes on his back and the, and the nails in his hands. What was in that cup, in this nasty cup, was what you and I deserve. All those sins all those mistakes, all those things that torment you from your past, he drank. He, he had to ask God to give him the strength to do it. That was, I love that part because that's one of Jesus' many, many parts where he shows his human form. And that's not weakness. That's something that we should all do in our moments of pain, in our moments of hurt, asking God, 
Let your will be done. And he had to do that for you and me. All those things that you're ashamed of that no one knows about is in this cup. All those things that, that hold you back, all those sins, all those things that, that hold you back from getting into this freedom, starting your business, getting better financially, being a better husband, wife, um, son, daughter, all that is in this cup. All your excuses. Who wants to drink it? But know that if you drink this, it doesn't even save you. It saves someone else who's undeserving. You notice that? Jesus didn't drink that cup for him. Jesus already, God already viewed Jesus as pure, perfect, in, in God's image. He drank this for you and me. He drank that cup. He asked for the strength that you and I could never have to take his place. That's the strength he was asking for, to fill your spot, to fill my spot. Who wants to drink it, huh? Nobody, huh? Knowing that if you drank something this crappy, it wouldn't even save your own soul. It would probably save someone else's, but yours is, you probably had to drink five more cups. <laughs> Me, I think I'm like a 10-cup guy. <laughs> but it, I, I wouldn't want to do it. I, I know myself, I wouldn't drink it for you. If I could see the list of all the things you've done, I don't think a lot of people would drink it. I don't think you'd drink mine. But Jesus decided to. He took this cup. You know why? You know why he drank this cup? So that you and I could be free. Unquestionably free. He did what you and I should have had to do so we could be cool. We could chill in his love. So that when we sing songs, sing amazing grace, that it, it could mean something and we could actually be it. He did that for you and me. And you know what? It may sound like, oh, Isaac, I've heard that before of Jesus' love. But when you start to realize how undeserving you are of it, man, it's, it's so beautiful. And, I've, and I feel like I'm falling back in love again with Jesus. But a lot of us, we try to go back to that moment when Jesus met us, where we had that God encounter. When, when, did, when is that biblical? Show me where. It says, find your first love, not your first encounter. And now I'm trying to find my first love again. Yeah. Not trying. I found him. He was in the same spot. I moved. Yeah. So I'm not looking for that same encounter. I'm hungrier for more. Yeah. Because when you're really in love with Jesus, you're always hungry for more. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Yeah. But it says, you know, the cup overflows. That's why he gave us this one. He drank this one, this nasty cup. So we could drink this one. I'm going to drink it. It's good water. <laughs> he took this one so that we could be free and, and always drink from this one. And every time we feel like we're empty and we're spent, he always refills. That's Jesus' commitment to you and I. So if you feel like you don't have the love of God or if God abandoned you, that's a lie. You're in your process. But jumping in the process of finding your love again. And that's why I showed you those, those three steps you got to admit, you got to admit that <laughs> you're jacked up. <laughs> you got to admit that uh, I'm failing here, God. I struggle here, God. All right, I need your help, Jesus. And then live free with it. Once you've done that, come to a place of humility with Jesus, you're free. Right from the moment that prayer ended, free. Free. It's that easy. It really is. We overcomplicate it. It's that easy. A, B, C, easiest one, two, three. Uh, that's my audition for the worship team. Steven, am I in? You're in. Awesome. But it's that easy. It is that simple. Because that, his, his death was complicated so that our life could be easier in his, in his acceptance of us. You know, and one last thing that, that blew me away from this whole thing of, of Jesus in the garden to him on the cross. You know in scripture it says that God looked away from Jesus. You ever question that? Why do you look away? And we just think, oh, because he, he bore the sins of the world and, and God was like, ah, scared. No. You know what that moment symbolizes? Is that 
God looked away from Jesus so he could look at us the way he looked at Jesus. He turned away because Jesus had to pay it all so he could look at you the way he looks at Jesus. And that's why I love this song, Amazing Grace, because it says, I can see you now. At that moment, it tore the veil that separated us from the love of God. And that's why you realize that scripture from Paul comes in the New Testament after already the veil had been torn and nothing could separate you and I from the love of Jesus. That's, what, that's how powerful my God is. How powerful do you view the same God with me? Is he that big to you? He's, he's humongous to me. Get on board. If you're not worthy, perfect. If you're full of mistakes, regrets, perfect. If, if, if you always struggle with, I'm not good enough, I'm not this, I'm not, perfect. You're in the right place. There's no requirements here. Shoot. Jesus is like, all entry, you know, come to the front. You don't got to pay a dime. Just come. That's all I want you to do. Just, just come. Right? Like the scripture said that they read in worship. Just come and worship him. That's it. That's all you got to do. He's there. He's present. Just make yourself available. Just raise your hand and surrender. That's what I had to do before I came out here. I was freaking out. I was like, Jesus, I, I, I want to fully fully believe it because it's an everyday struggle don't get me wrong just because you get it yesterday doesn't mean it's the same today and I was just like God I'm not leaving this room till you touch me because I, I want I want I want a double anointing that's what I told him I want a double anointing I'm like you're gonna touch me you're gonna make me feel feel worthy because that's what you say I am and I laid on the ground in there and I was like shoot I hope no one comes in because <laughs> I'm all crying and I was laying on the ground, and I was like, Jesus, show up. I'm, I'm calling you forth. I'm, I'm giving you the torment. I'm giving you the shame. I'm giving you the guilt. Take it. I'm yours tonight. I'm your servant, and I am free. So wherever you lead me, I'll go. It's just, it says in your word, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Make these dirty feet beautiful. Because trust me, they're crusty. <laughs> Not in real life, okay? We all got bumps, scratches, out of gas, but Jesus is the one who gets to refill, and that's what I did in there. I was like, God, refill me now so that I can pour out how, how we're all feeling tonight. And, and this is a partnership, really, from the stage to here. I'm no better. I'm not in like, oh, he's level 12, we're at level six, no. We're all at different walks with God. And that's the most beautiful thing about this thing is that we're all running a race, but we all get to win the same prize. So there's no competition. There really is. And, and I think it's, it's awesome that Jesus made it like a competition so that when someone's in the back, you can be like, come on, let's go. And I feel like that's what Jesus is doing for me tonight. And I'm willing for other people to run with me. I want other people to run with me. I want all of us to get into heaven one day and when Jesus see us, sees us, he doesn't just see you. He sees all the people that you brought with you because of your unquestionable uh, freedom that he gave you. So know that tonight you're free. For those he, he made free are free indeed. So live in that freedom. Live in that joy. It's available for you tonight.